Oh, here we go. All right, and welcome to those of you who are joining us from YouTube. My name is Jamie Vivak. I am the Will County Director for the Conservation Foundation. Because this is a webinar format, everyone's muted, your cameras are off. So if you're joining us today in your pajamas, no judgment here. Uh, this webinar is recorded, as I mentioned. So um, please check out our YouTube channel for all the past recordings of webinars that we've done. Um, and then see our event page on the Conservation Foundation website or our Facebook page to find out what web, uh, webinars are upcoming. If you have a question, please use the Q&A box that lets everybody see your question and also makes it easier for us to find them all. Sometimes they can get lost in chat, but we will make sure to take time to answer the questions during the presentation. For your safety, you should only be able to see what I post in the chat, but just in case we missed a setting or something wonky happens, please don't click any links other than what Skeet or I might put in the chat. On the TCF side, these webinars are offered free to the public. However, we do encourage you to consider a donation or a membership. The more people we have attending, the more it does cost us to run them. So um, at the end of the, this particular webinar, um, you'll see the Bartlett Tree Care page in case you have more questions or would like to get in touch with Skeet. Um, but please feel free to check out the Conservation Foundation's website as well to become a member or to uh, give a donation. So if you give a donation, you also have the option of becoming a member, which no different cost, it's the same thing. So um, if you are enjoying these webinars, I do encourage you to donate to help keep us running. Um, and as a member, you also get to enjoy a wide variety of our members only stuff. So with that, our upcoming webinars, uh, next week will be the last week we're doing two per week for August. We're sort of starting a little bit, um, just kind of a new date and time kind of thing. Uh, although the time will be the same. Thank you to those of you who took my survey. Uh, looks like the one o'clock time works well for most people. So we'll continue to do that. But we are moving to Wednesdays in August. So um, next week will we'll be the last Monday, Thursday set um, of these webinars. Monday on July 27th will be our Conservation at Home uh, intro class again. So if you're curious about our Conservation at Home program, wanna learn more about it, please check in on Monday and you'll find out more about how you can bring nature to your yard. And then on Thursday, July 30th is what's blooming. So I'm going to basically take a look out the window and we'll talk about some things that are blooming, uh, native plants that are blooming right now. We always wanna keep a variety of things blooming all throughout the seasons. So let's take a look at what's blooming right now. All right, so without further ado, um, I am introducing Skeet. Skeet is with Bartlett Tree Services. Skeet has a lifelong passion for trees. He has an AA in forestry from Paul Smith's College. Um, it has experience in sustainable management of the college's 14,000 acre property in the Adirondack Park in upstate New York. He's got a BS in forestry and an MS in resource management from the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry in Syracuse. He came to Illinois in 1991 and passed the International Society of Arboriculture Certified Arborist Examination. That's pretty cool. Uh, becoming the 126th certified arborist in the state of Illinois. Presently, there are over 1,600 certified arborists in Illinois, which is pretty cool too. Um, he also has a track certification, which is the tree risk assessment qualification. As a commercial arborist, Skeet enjoys sharing his knowledge of trees as a guest speaker at garden clubs, nurseries, and garden centers. He served as a guest instructor at Joliet Junior College and the Morton Arboretum. He was appointed to serve on the Naperville Riverwalk Commission. He's been on the radio, um, the Bill Moeller Show, WGN 720, the Mike Nowak Show, 1590. Um, so he is awesome. And we are so happy to have Skeet joining us here today to talk about trees. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, Skeet. Awesome. Thank you, Jamie. All right. How are we doing out there, Jamie? Are we up and running? Um, go ahead and share your screen. Okay, well, I'm gonna say hello, and then I'm gonna okay. do a screen save, or a screen share, excuse me. Um, Jamie, thank you for the introduction. Thank you to everybody who's tuning in, really appreciate it. 
Um, as Jamie said, um, usually on the radio, I've got a better face for radio than I do for TV or uh, the computer or Zoom meetings. Uh, I've attended many a Zoom meeting and hosting ones in other whole world. Uh, so I'm just gonna do my best out there. I'm gonna try to break this up a little bit and put in a couple timeouts and answer a couple questions. What I don't wanna do is PowerPoint you to fall asleep. Um, not that anybody's ever fallen asleep in a PowerPoint. So um, I'd like to move along that way, take some timeouts with, again with some questions. Um, there was a question out there about the river and the mountains. That's my background that I have going on. Uh, I just thought I'd mix it up a little bit and put a little action in there again to make sure everybody's paying attention, having fun today. So that's the game plan. Uh, also, um, any one of these topics can be in our presentation all to itself. So I just plan on touching on some areas, giving some information, if this goes really well and you email Jamie and say, hey, that tree guy was just awesome. You know, can we do just a program on planting or just a program on disease or just insects or something else? Um, if, if, if there's a need out there, we'll, we will jump in and help. That's just, just who we are. Um, so some people that um, are gonna ask them questions, Jamie's gonna help out with those questions and we're just going to um, we're just going to touch on basic tree care um, and you know we're, we're going to go from there so that's the game plan i'm going to pop on to this share screen we're going to get into the powerpoint here so hopefully this comes up and get to the beginning here All right. Uh, there we go. We're seeing this in notes view. Okay. If you can, the, the presenter's view, if you want to switch it. We might be stuck on the notes view. Hmm. Well, let's try that again. Maybe if you go to display settings up at the top. Hmm. Up in the center, there's display settings. Center. Uh, of course, it didn't look like this when we practiced. Right. <laughs> Good thing we did all that <laughs> practice so we'd have this correct. Hmm. Very Nine. top of your screen, it says display settings. Ooh. Display doesn't show that. Oh, I know what I need to do. I can do that. I can do this. I can do this. Hmm. Well, we may need to run this way, Jamie. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah, do that right there. Swap presenter there view and slide. There cool. you go. That's Are good. good. We're good. Excellent. Well, you can see I spend a lot of time outside looking at trees and not computer screens. So, okay, cool. Thank you, Jamie. Um, here's a couple of cool tree pictures. So we're just going to get started here. Um, has anybody heard of Bartlett Tree Experts? From Illinois, Bartlett Tree Experts gets very confused with a suburb of Bartlett. We're not from Bartlett, Illinois. We take care of Bartlett, Illinois. We take care of, um, we've got 140 offices throughout the United States and England, Ireland, and Canada. So Bartlett is the family name started by this gentleman, Francis Bartlett in 1907. So in Illinois, that's a little confusing when people hear about Bartlett Tree Experts. Um, again, here's all the uh, states and countries we're in. Um, there's a phone number there. Huge kudos to Jamie, who's uh, putting our website up at the end of the presentation. She's brilliant, a lot more brilliant than I when it comes to the computer. So thank you, Jamie, for the help there. 
Um, Bartlett uh, is known for scientific tree care. Um, this is pictures of our lab in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. This is where we've got our PhC, or PhDs, her PhDs, the doctors who do a tremendous amount of research, um, are just awesome. We do some great training programs. Crews get to go down there. Arborist reps get to go down there. A lot of training going on um, at, at our lab. Um, over 500 acres for the lab. We also have a very unique partnership with the Martin Arboretum where we have a lab extension, Dr. Chad Rigsby, who's also with, affiliated with the lab in Charlotte as an extension. Um, Dr. Rigsby lives in Illinois. Um, and we have a mini lab at the Martin, Ar Martin Arboretum and Robert Bartlett, uh, the third generation of the Bartlett family, um, is on the board of directors for the Martin Arboretum. So there's, there's a huge tie there. And um, we're the uh, presenting sponsor for the plant clinic. So if you're in Illinois, we train the uh, plant clinic people and volunteer at the plant clinic. So just a little information about Bartlett Tree Experts. And we need to put the cool pictures in there. They have some fun. So this is the first class of tree surgery way back in 1924. Um, just a real quick background. Thank you, Jamie, who I am. We went through all of this um, education, um, certified arborist, Riverwalk Commissioner. Uh, I live in Naperville. My wife and I live in Naperville with a little special needs cat. Her name's Timber. She's a sweetie. She has us wrapped around her paws. Um, and I helped with the EAB project for the city of Naperville and the Legacy Tree Program for Naperville. Uh, Bartlett Tree Experts, I come to you from Bolingbrook, not Bartlett, Illinois. Uh, if you heard me speak, I get a little animated. Luckily, um, I'm behind the computer screen because sometimes I throw things like candy bars and little stuffed trees and items to keep people awake and have some fun and you win prizes. So hearing me speak and see me speak sometimes gets to be a little animated and fun. Um, really appreciate the Conservation Foundation partnership if nobody's familiar with the Conservation Foundation, look them up, Google them, visit the farms, visit their office. It is an awesome organization. You want to talk about tree friendly, environmental friendly, water, land conservation. I mean, th this, this is the, the organization to be part of. Um, my wife and I volunteer, our company volunteers, just awesome. Uh, I'm going to go through the top 10-ish of tree care concerns that have come up um, this year. So um, I promise you there'll be some grody cool bug pictures, weird disease pictures. Um, so, and then afterwards, I'm gonna stick around a little bit for the old stump the arborist and um, stick with me here. Okay, top 10-ish, um, tree planting, chemical injury, scab and rust, um, rhizophyra, diplodia, um, the three, four, and five are needle diseases. Um, six, seven are insect diseases. Um, eight is a fungal. Um, nine is an insect. Scale is a scale. And then uh, burrow blight, which is um, getting more and more spread throughout the area. Bigger, bigger concern um, each year. Okay, um, this is critical. A lot of people just do not know how the trees, or discover a tree root system. 90% um, of the tree roots are within the first 12 inches of the soil surface. Tree roots do not go down to China. Don't believe all the cartoons. Um, the roots are on the surface. Why are they on the surface? Well, that's where the nutrients are for the, for the soil. It's right there on the surface. Think of the leaves, twigs, all that organic matter over the years is right on the surface. As we get deeper, we get into that clay. So it's very common to have surface roots of trees. That's not bad. That's how trees grow. That's what comes with a tree. Also, as you take a look at this picture, the tree roots do not stop at the drip line of the tree. They go past the drip line. They grow out. They can grow twice as far out as a tree is high. That is the ideal situation. 
in an urban environment, we don't deal with ideal. We deal with wrong tree, wrong spot, wrong way, wrong time of the year, and now it lived a year and a day, you're the arborist, fix it, make it work. Uh, and, and that's where we really need to start looking underground first, then above ground. So uh, I really like to have this picture in people's minds of what the ideal situation is and reality land does not match with ideal a lot of the times. Okay, again, this is gonna be a, a quick pictures and I try to have some fun. Please excuse my sarcasm. Um, I do that so people can maybe laugh, remember, have a little bit of fun with this. So um, hang in there, please. Um, this is gonna be a little fun. On the left, you buy a tree, you dig a hole, you put the tree in the hole, you put rocks around it, and now a tree's planted. That's a lot of times what we get. And then it lives a year and a day, and you get a one-year warranty, and that same tree you can live in, make live in a driveway for a year. And so a year and a day, then whoever plants it jumps out sometimes and says, well, it lived a year and a day, you need to call an arborist. And we start digging around, and we see what's going on with the tree, and we find out sometimes it's the planting. We need to remember where trees come from. When they're grown in nurseries, they start in that little tiny pot in the bottom. And then it gets to a bigger pot and a bigger pot and a bigger pot. All that growth many times will cause what's called girdling or twisted roots. So as time goes on, some nurseries are savvy enough to untangle the roots and get the tree in a bigger pot. Some just pull the tree out, as you see on the right, and you just dig a circle hole and you put it in the ground. Sometimes the landscapers, when they're planting, do not untangle or cut the roots. So when you see this and you see you know, the tree in the ground, a lot of times you just don't see where the tree came from. That's a huge challenge for us arborists. You know, most people don't call us when the tree's doing great. They call us a year or two or three years when it's in decline. And then they say, you need to come quick. This tree's crashing fast. Well, okay, well, to the novice eyes, to the homeowner's eyes, yes, it, it's dying quickly. To the arborist's eyes, this tree's been dying slowly. Um, and now we're seeing the results of it. So tree planting, we can't stress enough, right tree, right spot, right way, right time of the year. And we're gonna have less tree care concerns down the road. This is an awesome pictures. <clears throat> this is, both of these are blaze maples. Blaze maples were selected for this experiment because they're just so quick growing. And the tree, in, and so there was two trees planted. The tree on the left was planted by taking the tree out of the pot, digging that round hole and sticking it in the ground. The tree on the right was the round pot, cutting the roots before planting it, untangling the roots, planting it. And this is uh, four years after the tree was planted. We came in with a supersonic air tool, blew the soil out from, the, from around the, the base of the tree to investigate and look at the root system. On the left, the, you can see the circling roots. So, and if you look at the, the circle there, you, you can almost envision that five gallon pot where that tree came out of. On the right, you can see where those roots were cut ahead of time, untangled, we're not going to get the girdling roots. The tree on the left, as time goes on, those 
roots at the base of the tree, those circling roots are gonna grow in diameter. The trunk's gonna grow in diameter, and it's gonna get to that 10, 12, 14, 16 inch diameter when people start thinking, boy, now I finally have a tree. Boy, I finally have the shade. Boy, the tree is doing, this is really filling the spot. It's doing great. And then the tree starts to slowly die out. And it's slowly dying out because those roots are just encircled and killing it underground. That is an incredible level of frustration for us arborists. Um, so tree planting, again, critical to be done the right way. Okay, um, tree planting. Here's a couple pictures, um, you know, so many people are so trusting of their landscaper or if they're living in an association, the property manager. Um, attached are two wonderful pictures. Uh, one comes right from the Morton Arboretum. You can print this at home and you can hand it to the landscaper and say, I want my tree planted this way. That creates a really interesting discussion when the landscaper says, well, we don't do it that way. Why? Why would you not do it this way? The picture on the right is a little more detailed. Um, comes from the International Society of Arboriculture on how to plant trees. Critical items, at least the top layer of burlap, string, twine, that top layer really needs to be pulled back or removed um, the top layer. That little root flare, that area, that transition from tree to soil, critical to see the root flare. A lot of times the ball and burlap trees will have a lot of soil on top of that ball. Sometimes you need to dig out that root flare a good five, six, seven, eight inches. I've seen root flares 12 inches into the root ball, where the tree, if planted at ground level, would be 12 inches too deep. So plant high, drain well, hope like heck, over dig the hole, cut out those twisted girdling roots right from the beginning, and then stake the tree. Give it a little support, give it a little hug. Um, let that tree get, a, get established. Uh, especially with the, with the high winds and the prairie lands and the flatlands we have in Illinois and the clay soils, um, a little staking of that tree um, would be ideal. So these are just some basics. And again, right from the Martin Arboretum on how to plant trees, it's a one pager, really awesome detail. Um, I'd, I'd really like to see that used uh, at, at a greater level for our homeowners. Um, and, and, and landscapers. Uh, you know, how did Mother Nature plant trees? Planted by seed, and that seed found its correct equilibrium in the ground and knew where, knew how to grow itself. Uh, we were, people are asking for bigger trees to start with, higher expectations, and the trees are getting planted deeper and deeper because they're bigger and bigger trees. Landscapers are thinking a lot of times or looking out for the homeowner. That way the tree doesn't blow over because homeowners and landscapers and property managers and residents and golf courses may not want those stakes there because the stakes don't look neat. Um, park districts, it's a slip, trip, and fall issue uh, if you, you put stakes out, especially metal stakes. You know, so I, I feel for park districts. Um, so it, it's very difficult though, proper planting to start with minimizes tree care concerns. And, and again, right tree, right spot, right way, right time of the year. Questions, Skeet, yep. if we can. Awesome, um, yes. First off, Florence would like to know, is that true of conifers too, twice the tree height for the roots? Absolutely, yes it is. Okay, and, um, Another question it says, my nursery sells and plants trees in burlap and wire cages. They say to just leave the burlap. Is that accurate? 
I would like to see, and I switched off so you guys can see me answering the question. So again, I'm trying to break it up a little bit, have some fun. And then Jamie, I'm gonna need to get that PowerPoint. So you're gonna coach me again, I apologize. No problem. Uh, it's the way it is. Um, I would love to see at least the top half of that burlap removed. You know, on smaller trees, you can take, you know, that all the burlap string wire twine on a one, two inch tree, you can take that all out of there. Um, but at a minimum, that top half of the wire and uh, the burlap out. Um, you know, some, sometimes these trees are wrapped with two or three layers of burlap. People just don't realize that. Um, and then, you know, and you're thinking you're watering the tree, the water's not even getting into the root ball. And if it does, then it just sits in there because it's just a soggy mess in there. And you really don't overwater trees, you suffocate trees by too much water that pushes the oxygen out and then the tree dies. So at least that top half burlap, plus you can look for that root flare. How deep is that tree in the root ball? So dig that out. Is there twine? Trees do not get along with plastic and twine. Get that out of there. Um, so at least the top half. So that's a long answer. I apologize, Jamie. Okay. And um, let's see. Oh, and Gordon wants to know, what is the best time to plant trees? <sighs> Some trees are, are um, spring dug. Some trees are fall dug. I do not have that list memorized. You can okay. Google search on which trees are spring dug and fall dug. Perfect. If it's a spring dug tree, I'd like to see it planted in spring. That way it's not, not dug in spring, healed in all summer, and then planted in fall. If it's fall dug, I'd like to see it planted in fall. In general, um, I'm not so much worried about when the best time to plant, I'm more worried about what's the care and maintenance with the planting. So spring, you can generally guarantee the tree was dug in spring. So it went from the nursery to your yard within a month or two. That's fantastic. Um, the technology is there with a lot of trees that you can also plant in fall uh, when the leaves are, are turning and, you know, it's going to be planted, it's already starting going dormant, and then come spring, it's got a whole new life and a new home, that's fine too. Um, I'd like to see a lot of trees that have needles planted in spring so they can harden off and get adjusted going into the winter time. Though if you do plant an evergreen conifer in fall, um, the watering regime on that's just gonna be a little more critical so it has the moisture going into winter time. So um, that, that would just be some basic ideas. Yeah. Um, and then a couple of questions about circling roots. Um, yeah. Catherine says she has a trainer front yard that was planted incorrectly and has circling roots and is young. Is it possible to remedy this? And Judy has an established tree with circling roots over 15 years old. The girdling roots. Um, we really need to see the tree to get a better understanding. There is a tool called an air spade, um, and we have a supersonic air tool that blows the soil out, as you saw in that picture. We can find a lot of these girdling, twisted roots, cut the roots out, uh, which looks like a painful, ugly, what are you doing to my tree, yikes situation. Um, and the tree, a lot of times, can respond to that. It's a tree by tree situation. But something Some you should probably see the professionals. Yeah, you definitely need to. Um, that's where the science and the art come together. Some of the trees that are super girdled, uh, we may, uh, you know, there's times when I've come in and said, let's just do 25% of the base of the tree, wane a year, do another 25%, and work our way around the tree over an eight year time frame um, because we are cutting roots of the tree. We, we are injuring the tree for the long-term good, and there's not a, a precise formula for that. It's experience. Yep. And let's do one more question, and then we'll let you get back to it. Um, 
Beth says, I have a volunteer oak tree growing in my garden that I'd like to transplant to a different area of our yard. What season would be best for transplanting? Oh, I would, I would think about fall once the tree starts going dormant and really, you know, sooner is better than later because you got a smaller tree, you got a better chance of success. Um, and that's where I would call in a professional landscaper who knows how to dig trees, move trees, um, get their opinion on it, make sure it's got plenty of water ahead of time. And depending on where it's located, to get a good root ball on that, you may be damaging other trees and shrubs. So again, that's, that's one of those we really got to see it on site. I will say I had, my neighbors have great big oak trees and the squirrels love to plant them in my vegetable garden. I had one that was like, I let grow for about two years. It was about this big, maybe a little bit bigger. I dug it out of my garden. I put it in a spot in my yard, mulched it in really good, watered it in really good. And it is gorgeous. It is yeah. doing incredibly well. You know, and the nice part about that is, I'm gonna go on a little bit of a tangent, so I apologize. Um, that is um, just like um, Possibility Place. They grow their trees from seed. Mm -hmm. So you know the top and the bottom are local to that area. Right. Where a lot of our trees, a majority, 99% of the trees are grafted, where it has a root stock and trunk stock, and we just don't know um, where those two trees came from. Um, so you, you've got, you were talking about native and natural. That's awesome. So that's, that's another whole talk for another day. So, <laughs> all right, sorry, Jean. All right, we'll let you get back to your presentation now and we'll come back for more questions later. It was a tough one to stop on because I love it. All right, how are we looking there? All right, good. You wanna go ahead and share your screen. Oh, okay, oh. Uh, what did I do? All right, sorry guys. There you go. Okay. And good. Are we in the right presentation? Or are we still in the um, presentation? We're not, we're not in presentation view yet. Okay, no problem. And then you told me to go to, where am I going? Should be up at the top. Yep. And what am I looking for again? Sorry. Uh, just that play. I'm sorry, say that again? Um, just the play, because we're, we're seeing the um, editing view. Play. Unless that's your second screen, maybe. That's my second screen. Hmm. Sorry, Jamie, I'm not finding that again. Can you swap screens? Oh, uh, I don't know why it's flipping over like that each time. I'm sorry. Hmm. Uh, yeah, then what, I'm sorry, what do I look for on top again? Actually, if you just go all the way up to the top where you yep. see like right above the word home and just to the right that fourth button there should start it again fourth button for slideshow slideshow oh okay huh. sorry everybody just give us a second yep sorry <laughs> Yeah. Technology. Right. What can we say? Well, I think we're going to go this way then. Oops. There you go. Swap. There we go. That's, that's it. 
There you go. Oh, We're good. Boy, I apologize, everybody. Cool. Jamie, you're so patient. Okay. Um, this one we're seeing more and more and more and more. Um, so here's what we got going on. Client calls us out, says, hey, you know, all my burning bush look terrible. They just look really bad. Um, you know, there's got to be an insect or disease out there. You know, my neighbor's burning bush look good, but why do mine look terrible? What kind of insect or disease do we have going on here? Uh, this is the ends of the, of the burning bush. Anybody have any guess of what's going on with this? Okay, well, time's up. Um, what we've got going on, and you can really see it on the first slide here, you see all the way around this bed, there is nothing growing in this bed, nothing. Not only is there nothing growing in the bed, we've got um, the, <laughs> the edge of the grass, you see it's yellowing out, this is all herbicide damage. And we're seeing more and more as we look at Roundup and homeowner use of Roundup and landscaper use of Roundup. This Roundup 365 stuff, holy schmoly. The plants are soaking this up. It is killing the plants. Uh, we just really need to be careful. I mean, any product you can put on the ground and, and it prevents weeds for 12 months Wow, I mean, that's just danger, danger. Uh, you know, you look at the back of this, uh, you know, it's, it's rainproof in 30 minutes. You put this down and 30 minutes later it rains and it's gonna be there for 12 months, yikes. Um, here's another one, you know, it, it kills for four months. Um, again, just really, really dangerous. Um, really, really makes me nervous. This is rainproof in, uh, in 10 minutes, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, just makes me very nervous and we see more and more problems um, just due to chemical activities in trees. The white bottle Roundup uh, is not as bad and um, this, this, is a, is a much better product. If somebody wanted to use Roundup, this is a better product of all of them. Um, I would, still wouldn't recommend it, but it, it's, it's uh, a, the, old, the old Roundup. Um, so just, just a heads up out there. We're seeing that more and more, a lot of homeowners do not know the landscapers are even using it. A lot of associations may not know the landscapers are using it. It's very challenging for us when the landscaper brings us out to, a, to an association or to one of their top clients and says, boy, the trees are looking really terrible. Could you help us out? What do you think? You know, what's the insect or disease? And you need to pull the landscaper aside and say, it's really not insect or disease. Um, this, is, this is all chemical damage. Um, and their crews may not know what they're doing when they're using the product. This is not one of those where little is good, more is better. It's not that type of product. So um, just friendly heads up. We're just seeing this more and more and more and more. Okay, um, scab and rust. Okay, we're getting into diseases. Um, scab and rust. In Illinois, there's 350 varieties of crab apple. And so each one of those varieties of crab apple are gonna have a different level of susceptibility to scab and rust. What brings on scab and rust? It's a leaf fungus. It's brought on by cool, wet weather. May this year, May was the rainiest, the wettest year on record for weather. And so it is a banner year this year for scab and rust on hawthorn and crabapple trees. Um, this is a variety of hawthorn or crabapple, excuse me. Um, the Martin Arboretum has a wonderful crabapple list of recommended crabapples. It's a really awesome list because it talks about the flower, the fruit size, um, the leaf size, the shape of the tree, and the hardiness to resistant, the less susceptible to scab and rust. I've seen crabapple trees this year that have scab and rust that we never needed to treat, haven't had a problem, and this year they've got a lot of yellow and black splotches on the leaves. In general, um, scab and rust will not kill the crabapple trees. However, year after year after year, 
of scab and rust leaf fungus on the hawthorns and crab apples, we are seeing crab apples and hawthorns die due to this. And so again, right tree, right spot, a less susceptible variety. There are no crab apples that are resistant. Resistant is a very strong word. I would say less susceptible. Um, and this is just, this is something that if you have a crab apple and you want the leaves to stand longer, then we're talking about treatments. Uh, this is a hawthorn tree. Again, um, same, same leaf fungus on, on the tree. On the left is quince rust, which is a, a different type of fungus um, due to the wet spring. Okay, needle cast, rhizophyra. Uh, we're seeing this more and more and more because the last four, five, six years, it's been a heck of a wet spring. Um, we see this on Colorado blue spruce. The key word there is Colorado. We're in Illinois, we're in the Midwest, we're not in Colorado. Colorado blue spruces just don't do well outside of Colorado. And so uh, we're seeing the needle fungus come into these trees. It's evidenced by the kind of yellowish in the middle in the, in the spring, summer. Um, you see all the spores and those, these perfect lines on the needles. I mean, you really gotta be a tree geek to get into this stuff. Uh, but you see those perfect lines of the spores um, right, right down the needles of the, of the spruce trees. Uh, unfortunately, this is a situation where people generally call um, when it's late, too late, or you know, they're looking for that lower screening and uh, we, we run into some issues trying to get the trees turned around. The Plodia tip blight, um, Austrian pine trees, they, they're, they're just not hardy in the Illinois area. Um, the Morton Arboretum on their website says not recommended. Um, I've worked with the city of Naperville. Naperville does not allow Austrian pine trees on commercial sites or on common ground associations. So the city is looking to not have Austrian pine trees. If a homeowner wants to plant it, that's great. Uh, but due, due to the uh, Dothostroma and the Plodian needle blight, um, just Austrian pine trees are very, as they get to that uh, 15 to 25 year range, they, they start to die out very quickly due to these needle funguses. Zimmerman pine moth goes with the Plodia. Um, this is on Austrian pine trees, Scots pine trees, even Mugo pine trees can get the Zimmerman pine moth and the Diplodia and the Dothostroma. Um, this is a moth that lays eggs. The eggs turn to larvae. The larvae eat the middle of the tree. The tree's response is to have that ooze or sap or white mass um, oozing out of the trunk of the tree. Now here's the fun part. I pointed this out one time and I mentioned to the homeowner that the sap globs are make great fire starter. She has a Girl Scout troop and she does not want to treat her tree because the Girl Scouts come over and get the gobby goos and get the sap masses out and that's their fire starter for their camping trips. And so she's happy to have her Austrian pine tree in decline um, for the good of the Girl Scouts. So. Just, just some interesting fun. Okay, emerald ash borer. Um, at this point, if you haven't treated your ash tree, the ash tree is probably dead. Um, emerald ash borer um, came to Illinois about 10, 15 years ago. Uh, and kudos to the city of Naperville. Um, they've got over 98% success rate treating their parkway trees. Treatments are very effective. Um, we're really excited about treating ash trees with emerald ash borer um, because of the success rate. A uh, couple of key points you need to know if you've got an ash tree. Uh, so, because a lot of people accuse the emerald ash borer of killing other trees, it's host specific to ash trees. And you'll see the bug on the right eats the leaves lays eggs, the eggs turn to larvae, the larvae eat the trunk of the tree, you see the tunneling in there. 
You also see the exit holes, those D-shaped holes. Um, so it's specific to ash trees. White ash, green ash, blue ash, um, autumn purple, white ash. So specific to ash trees. Um, this is a picture of some very large ash trees um, on a street in Naperville in the parkway. You know, and you can see these trees are just doing great. So kudos to the city. Treatments are effective um, and, and heck, of a, heck of a lot less cost than taken out. Every single tree in this picture is an ash. You can imagine that street without any ash trees starting over. Um, this is a nice report from the city of Naperville. Um, and it, it talks about the, the benefits of the treatments, the cost of the treatment. So just a really nice one page summary. Okay, uh, moving on, tar spot. We get a lot, of, a lot of calls about maple trees. They got these big, ugly black spots. You're like, what does it look like tar? Yes, well, hey, let's keep it simple for us. Goofy arborists, we'll call it tar spot. And that's what it is. It's just a leaf fungus. You generally see this on the lower part of the tree because that's where the leaf holds the moisture longer. So it creates a favorable environment in the lower part of the tree, the shadier part of the tree. You don't see it in the top part of the tree because the wind, the air, the light dries the leaves out. It does not hurt the tree, doesn't harm the tree, doesn't need any treatments whatsoever. This is an aesthetic situation. Um, so it's just the way it is with uh, many Norway maple trees. And, and I'm sorry, you see it in silver maple trees too, but in general, it's maple trees. Maple bladder gall, we get this call a lot too. Oh my goodness, look at all the weird gross things and the bumps on the leaves. Okay, this is, doesn't need any treatment, doesn't cause any problems. It is again, a strictly aesthetic situation. Little wasps come in, they insert, they suck out the nutrients, the tree's response, kind of like getting a mosquito bite, um, is to have these weird bumps on the leaves does not cause any problems at all. No treatment needed. Scale. These are little tiny insects that insert in and they suck the nutrients out of the, out of the plant. This, these scales can kill plants. Upper left is euonymus and it's killing the euonymus. It's covered um, and that's the white underneath that picture, bottom left. Um, on the right, Bottom is oyster shell scale, so there's different varieties of scale. In the summer, these two scales will hatch, and underneath each one of those little brown or um, scale could be anywhere from 50 to 200 crawlers. So you can see where this spreads very quickly. Birds, bugs, bunnies, chipmunks all bring it and spread it. To different uh, plants. On the upper right is pine and needle scale and on the left is magnolia scale. Magnolia scale um, has really gotten to be rampant in the, in the western suburbs. It used to be really just near the, the lake area. It's now uh, throughout the western suburbs of the Chicagoland area and the left the magnolia scale is the biggest scale we work with. It is large, it looks like popcorn on the branches and you can hand squish these guys. So, I mean, if somebody wanted to stay away from chemical treatments, you just get in there with a pair of gloves and you can hand squish them. Um, the scale sucks out the nutrients, they deposit the sugars or honeydew. The honeydew lands on the leaves, it gets a sooty mold. That's why the leaves turn brown and black. Usually we, what we do, usually what happens is we'll get a call saying, my tree has a leaf, my magnolia has a leaf fungus and the bees love it. Well, you're close. The bees are going after the sugar the, from the honeydew, from the scale sucking on the plant. It really doesn't have a fungus, it's the scale that's causing the issues. Uh, so that's, that's, and magnolia scale is very difficult to treat. Uh, it takes multiple applications. They're very large and they're very frustrating. Okay, Baroque blight. Baroque blight is something that's come to Illinois in the last, oh boy, five or so years. Uh, 
It affects specifically bur oak trees, not white oak, not red oak, bur oak. It's characterized by that V, and then on the upper, the, the brown spot, V and the leaves. And then on the petiole is really swollen uh, left side. And since it's a type of fungus, again, fungus are the bottom parts of the leaf. So bottom part of the trees, excuse me. So you really see the picture on the right, the bottom leaves, brown, cupped, curled, um, dying out. That's bur oak blight. Um, and uh, we get good control of bur oak blight when the tree is smaller, younger. Uh, the older trees, it's a little more difficult to get control and um, get ahead of the bur oak blight. Um, so, but you're really characterized by that swelled petiole um, as it attaches to the um, to this branches. All right, we got a little bonus in there. How about if we take some questions, Jamie? I went through the, the diseases kind of quick. Yes, we definitely have some questions on diseases. Um, first off, Josh asked, what are treatment options for crab apple with yellowing leaves midsummer? My guess is cedar apple rust. Okay. Now, I'm gonna kind of geek you out a little bit on this one. Um, if the leaves are yellow without spots, that's not an insect or disease. When it's in the high humidity, because we get these calls a lot in June, July with the, with the high humidity. Uh, crab apple trees, alder trees, elm trees, ash trees, river birch trees, white birch trees. When it gets hot, the tree's defense mechanism is to pull in that chlorophyll and drop solar panels. It's too hot, they can't keep up. That may not mean extra watering, that just means it's hot. So the trees will naturally drop yellow leaves. That's all normal, does not need treatments. Um, and, and you'll see when they're small yellow leaves, so the tree's producing new leaves, gets too hot, tree says to heck with it, I'm shutting down, pulls the chlorophyll back out of that leaf and drops leaves. That's normal, no treatment. If the tree has the black splotches on it, the yellow dots on it, um, the spores, then you're into some treatments. If it's the middle of summer, it's a real tough call to make. Um, some clients want us to treat the tree with a foliar application, even though ideally that's a preventative. What we're treating is the new leaves are trying to slow it down a little bit. Some clients say, you know what, let's just let it go and let's pick it up next spring because we want to do a preventative more than March, April, May timeframe than just to uh, do any treatments June, July. Next question. Right. Um, along that same line, uh, Sherry says, I had an arborist slash tree company out to look at our poor apple tree due to yellow spotted dying leaves. He said to wait till fall to start a series of spraying. Yes or no? Is that and same then, thing you think? Yeah, that's a, and that was a crab apple tree? Um, it just said apple tree. An apple tree? Um, oh, a, a foliar application would best be completed in the spring of the year because we got to get the leaf out then we've got to put an active ingredient or a preventative on the leaves. There are some organizations that um, will do a trunk injection and then the fungicide is in the tree. So as the tree leaves out in spring, it has that application in the leaves. That is good application if you're near water because you don't want a foliar application. You don't want that active ingredients to get into the water. The downside to that application is it needs to be done every single year. And if it's truly an apple tree, then it's gonna be in the tree, which is in the fruit, which um, I'm very hesitant to do if you wanna eat the apples, very hesitant to do. There is a fruit tree protocol and you need to be licensed to treat fruit trees. That's different than in Illinois. You need to have a, a pesticide license 
um, there's a very specific class and um, oh, I forget the, I'm not thinking of the right name for it, but there, after you take the general standards, there's an endorsement for fruit trees. So anytime if you're, uh, I, I'm very hesitant to do any systemic or trunk injection on an apple tree for the matter of fact that you, we, we would not do that um, because it, it would benefit, it would be in the tree to affect the fruit. So I'll just, I'll just put it right out there. So. Yeah. Good to know. So if you're, if you're dealing with a fruit tree, then make sure the company that you're working with knows that and is licensed then to deal with fruit trees. Correct. And if they're doing a systemic or a trunk injection, um, I, I, I would not be eating the fruit. Yes. Right. Um, so, uh, switching gears a little bit to emerald yep. ash borer. Uh, yep. Betty wants to know, is every two years correct for emerald ash borer treatment? Yeah, it depends on the treatment. Great question, Betty. The trunk injection for emerald ash borer is every other year. There's also a soil application or systemic that is applied at the base of the tree, and that can be done every year. Depending on the diameter of the tree, depending on the location of the tree, depending on the girdling roots or the, the, um, the root flare, the health of the tree, um, make some differences on what recommendation would be. In general, um, I'm more of a um, soil systemic than I am drilling and putting plugs in the tree. Um, I've seen some trees drilled to death and loved to death because it's done every other year. And if that's been done for say 10 years, that's five times on a smaller diameter tree, um, that that is affecting the health of the tree. In the Illinois area, Emerald Ash Borer, the wave has gone through, the populations have dropped tremendously. It may not need to be done every other year. It may need an every year with a soil application. Uh, we're working with the city forester in Naperville. They're going to a three-year trunk injection because the populations of emerald ash forest dropped off so dramatically. Um, about that. I'd rather see the city of Naperville experiment on their trees than they experiment on one of our clients' trees. So we're going to see what the results of their experiment is um, to, to, to see if it's really needed every other year. So, Betty, that's a long answer, but boy, I hope that helps. Um, one more quick question, and then we'll we'll let you get back to it. Um, I just I just love this question. Will a dog constantly peeing on the same tree eventually kill it? We lost our apple tree, and we think it's because of the dog. Wow. Um, if it's a small little tree, yeah, that that's way too much nitrogen. Uh, we we see it on boxwoods because boxwoods are smaller. And um, we, so we, we can see that. And if it's a big dog and if it's a constant, absolutely, it sure can. Uh, and if you see no other weeds or grass or, or anything else growing around it, yeah, that, that's a nitrogen overload. Um, it'd be really neat to experiment and uh, put a pair of gloves on and get a soil sample and send that out to a lab and see what the nitrogen level in that soil yeah, is. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah. That is, yeah. That is interesting. Yeah, cool. Loving the questions. We have, we have a lot more very specific questions too, but just out of respect for time, we'll let you get back to okay. um, your slides and yeah. we'll keep going. Cool, all right. Um, how are we doing, is that the right? Gotta share your right screen. Slide? You Looking gotta good? share your screen first. Share my screen. Oh, every time I do that, it bounces. I'm sorry, Jamie. You're fine. Oh, yeah. I don't know why it doesn't stay PC only. Okay. We should be there, PC only. All right. Whoops. How are we doing? Is that the right? Nope. Okay. Share screen. Wow. All right. Are we up? Yes. Okay. We're good? Yes. Awesome. Thank you, Jamie. Okay, here's a little bit of fun. Um, just 
just as an idea, I do this for most of my talks. If anybody's been to one of my talks, you can just shout out because you're the only one there to know the answer. Here's a label. Um, you know, we talked about chemicals and use of chemicals. Um, here's a label of a very common product. It's, and I'm just going to read it real quick because it's kind of small. You know, it says three in one fluid flammable. So this, this is flammable. Keep away from heat sources, spark and flame. This has got a danger poison, one of the highest levels, contains methanol, fatal causes blindness of swallow, vapor is harmful, cannot be made non-poisonous. So this product cannot be non-poisonous, cannot be. This is first aid of swallow, call physician, hospital, emergency room, poison control center, immediately eye contact, flush with water, 15 minutes, get prompt medical attention, warning. This I find interesting, warning. The product contains a chemical known in the state of California to cause birth defects or reproductive harm. Only for people in California. Nobody else gets reproductive or, or defects, just the people of California. Um, keep out of reach of children. Directions for use. Use full strength. Do not dilute this. Pour directly. So this is a product. Any guesses what this is? You ready? There you go. This is windshield wiper fluid. So, and hopefully, Jamie, that's showing up there. Yep, I can see Awesome, that. so this is windshield wiper fluid. So if we think about what anybody can go to the big box stores and buy four products, um, here's just, as you can see, there's the label that I read to the left and there's the splash windshield wiper fluid. So really please read labels. They're critical, they're there for a reason. There's a 1-800 phone number, there's a Google, you can look these up, you can get the MSDS sheets. Please read the labels before you use anything, including windshield, windshield wiper fluid. How many times we are, are we keeping a, your car running, adding this, and it says flammable, and you're adding this to your car, when the windshield to, with the engine running, windshield wiper fluid. So, all right, I'll get off my soapbox on that one. So, there we go. All right. And I'm closing that out. I'm Xing out. And I am ready for some questions. It's two, it's after two o'clock. So, if anybody's got to go, I'm certainly not offended and I wouldn't even know it. Uh, but I'll stick around and answer a few more questions if that's good with you, Jamie. Yeah, that's perfect. We usually go a few minutes over with questions. Okay. That's just kind of how it always goes. So um, I have noticed a couple of questions, people looking for advice on pruning shrubs, trimming trees, <sighs> advice on that. Got it. Well, that's going to be a long time. Um, that, that's another whole seminar for another whole day. Um, in general, I'm going to just do a really quick in general. Um, oaks and elms need to be done in the dormant season sometime after uh, a couple frosts. So generally December, January, February, March, uh, beginning of April, oaks and elms, only time to prune them. Um, most of the time, um, you know, every other, it's, boy, it's really hard to do some generalizations on this one. Uh, I'm, I'm just speaking trees. Every other tree can be pruned any other time of the year, uh, depending on what the goals are. If the goals are building clearance, sometimes it's better to do that when the trees leafed out and you get some better building clearance. If the goal is structure, form, um, sometimes it's better to do that in the dormant season when there's no leaves. You can really see what you're pruning because there's no leaves. Uh, shrubs, um, you know, I don't like to prune shrubs in the middle of summer. Um, that uh, July, August time frame when it's really hot, I'm not a big fan of pruning them. They'll die back, you'll get a lot of brown spots in them. Um, so that, that's a situation by situation. Um, and, and there's another whole hour and a half presentation on just proper pruning. So I, I guess we'll just leave it at that for now, Jamie maybe do your research depending on the types of trees that you're looking into or the shrubs you're looking into. Cause I know like for flowering shrubs, 
a lot of times you have to prune them at the right time or they'll, um, you know, you won't get the flowers that year. Correct. Here is, I just, I'm in my office, so I just reached up and grabbed this. With booklet. your background, we can't see it. Oh, okay. Um, there's a U5040, Pruning and Care of Trees and Shrubs by Giles. He is, he has the um, best um, booklet here on pruning. And so... Um, that, that would be my suggestion. And I'm trying to stop a video here. So um, I, I would, I would, I would use, I would go to that. And you, and um, yeah, it's uh, pruning and care of trees and shrubs by Giles. It's U5040. And that, that's, that's the, that would be an, that's an awesome book. Um, do fertilizers like Tree Secret that purport to help all types of trees really work? Well, I'm not familiar with Tree Secret. Oh, fertilization is absolutely beneficial. Uh, it's how you fertilize and the ratios of fertilization. Ideally, there would be a few soil samples taken so then we know what's deficient. If you're working in an urban environment, uh, clay soils, uh, a once a year fertilization is needed. Um, that would be a recommendation, yes. Liquid ground injected, get the fertilizer be below the grass layer. The grass is this really thick layer. So fertilizing through the grass into the tree root is ideal. Um, there's a lot of trees with nutrient deficiencies, and so then you're into a trunk injection. Um, sometimes they're just so yellow, so nutrient deficient, they need a trunk injection uh, in order to be alive and, and keep the tree. And then, yes, um, the, those are all fertilization in general is a recommendation, part of basic tree care, part of mulching, watering. Yes. Okay. Um, oh, Donna wants to know the, the spelling of the author's name on that booklet that you were recommending. Sure. Uh, F-A-G-I-L-E-S. All right. Um, let's see. Oh, I uh, have a tall basswood tree in my backyard. Leaves are being chewed up to skeletons by Japanese beetles. Can anything be done or is this a lost cause? All right. Great question. Um, okay. Japanese beetles. In general, 30 plus years doing this, I have never seen a tree shrub plant die because of Japanese beetles. So in my opinion, it's an aesthetic situation. I'm really not a big fan of spraying for the good of spraying. Uh, so generally, I just say is that it just comes with the territory of that tree. Japanese beetles like that tree. Um, if the tree's in good health, the tree's gonna be fine. I've not seen a basswood or linden die because of Japanese beetles. I see people upset, I see skeletonized leaves, I see frustrations, we don't see dead trees. So, um, I'm not a big fan of spraying for that situation. Um, is there a foliar application or two? Yes, there's foliar applications. Do not, please, please, please do not do a systemic. The tree will absorb it and it's actually illegal to do because it, it'll be in the fully, excuse me, it'll be in the flowers in the spring of the year and then the bees will feed on the flowers and it causes bee death. So no systemics on lindens or basswood trees. There is foliar or spray um, that will kill the Japanese beetles. The downside is it kills the beetles and then tomorrow another whole wave of Japanese beetles comes in and now they gotta eat the leaves and they gotta eat the leaves to ingest the active ingredient to die. So you're still gonna have damage. Um, and so 
then people say, well, can you spray every day? That's not reasonable. Um, and, and so it's just this time of the year is Japanese beetle season. They're going to eat, they're going to move on, and the tree's going to bounce back. So um, not a big fan of Japanese beetle applications in general. And you're just giving my opinion on that. Um, so um, and, and do not, whatever you do, use Japanese beetle traps in yeah. your yard. They will bring Japanese beetles from the entire neighborhood to your yard and they will snack along the way. So yeah. do not use those in your yard. Yeah, um, that pheromone in there is really wonderful to put on the interns' hard exactly. hands. You know, exactly. You know, put, put them in your neighbor's yard, but I didn't say that. But yes, keep them out of your yard. Yep. Uh, let's see. Catherine wants to know, is mulch recommended for maple trees? Oh, mulch is the single best thing you can do for all trees. As an arborist, I'd like to get rid of all the grass, no turf, all mulch. Um, so yes, mulch is fantastic. We used to laugh at these silly homeowners that do the one, one foot ring of mulch because we saw the trees. What's a one foot ring of mulch do? One foot ring of mulch keeps the weed whackers, lawnmowers away from the trunks of the trees. So the general guideline is one foot up to 100 feet. That's the general guideline for mulching. I'd love the rather see 100 feet mulch rings than a one foot ring. That's not the real world, but it's what we'd really love to see. Um, grass inhibits tree roots. There's a lot of biology that does not help the trees when you have turf. So mulching is fantastic. Then we get into mulch like a donut, not like a volcano. So keep the mulch off the trunk of the trees, a good six, eight inches to a foot away from the trunk of the tree. Mulch out, not up. So yeah, yes, that's, mulch, mulch. That's huge. I, I see that so often from even professional landscape companies. They mulch all the way up the tree yes. and then people wonder why the trees die. Or they wonder why we, why, gee, why do we have girdling roots? Uh, the roots are growing where the mulch is. Where's the mulch? Oh, around the trunk of the tree. Oh, got it. Yeah. yeah you got to keep that tree bare for that trunk of the tree bare so that, because as the mulch decomposes, it will actually start to decompose the trunk as well. So you yes. want to keep that dug away like a donut, like you said. That's mulch a good like a donut, not like a volcano. The Martin right. Arboretum has some great guidelines and some wonderful pictures on how to mulch. So that's another one you can just hand to the landscaper and say mulch like this. Boom. Yeah. Done. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Municipalities. I, God, I, I see it everywhere and it makes me crazy. When, once you know it, you start seeing it everywhere and you're like, ha ah, why is people doing this? Yes. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, the Japanese maple in my garden gets crispy and curly. An arborist I had in before it leafed out this year said it needs more water, but that hasn't kept it from happening again this year, though I've watered it a lot. It actually happened earlier. Yep. Yes, um, it is moisture stressed to the, to the margins of the leaves. Well, when it gets super hot, the Japanese maples just cannot keep up with the water. And so there's, there's not a lot you can do with that. It's just the way it is. Um, there's so many different varieties of Japanese maples. If it could be shaded or protected a little bit, that's an alternative. If it can't, then it can't. Um, you're just gonna live with some brown margins on the leaves. Uh, in general, this is one of those in general, uh, Japanese maples are, are not on my top list of preferred trees to plant. You think how many hundreds are being sold in nurseries and you look at landscapes and you don't oh, you see, them, see them out there. Yeah. I call them about the seven year perennial. They last about seven to 10 years. They generally die out and people say, boy, I really love it. What do I do? Plant another one and, and, and go from there. Um, but the, those, and, and there's so many different varieties of Japanese maples and grafted varieties and varieties that just do not grow well in this area. Uh, you see them on the big box stores all over the place. Um, you're going to get some brown and black margins because it just gets too darn hot. And they've got that lacy, thin, they're not thick, they're not hardy, and that's just the way it's going to be for Japanese maples. Uh, Michelle wants to know, do dogwoods get scale too? 
They can. Um, um, there's actually something called calico scale. Um, I didn't put that up there because there it's not very common. And so dogwoods can get scale. Yeah. Yep. All right. Um, what's the treatment for needle cast on Colorado spruce? Is it cost effective to treat a large tree that's affected about 50%? <sighs> um, <laughs> cost effective is a tough question to answer because some people will love their tree and because of where the tree is located, it is critical for shade screening, the value of that tree. Um, so that's a tough one to, to answer. Uh, is, is it an effective treatment? We get good success with the treatments. What's brown or dead is not gonna come back alive. And remember, all evergreens lose about a third of their needles every year. So they lose interior needles, they only grow on the outside. So reasonableness, expectation-wise, uh, what you see is what you're gonna get. It's not gonna get better, it's just not gonna get worse. So cost-wise, um, cost-effectiveness, um, that's one you're going to need to get a price on and then value that tree. And it's going to take a few years to get positive results because we're treating the new growth. The old growth is already infected. The old growth is going to reinfect the new growth. So it's going to take a few seasons to really get that tree turned around. So that's, that's one of those aesthetic questions and cost effectiveness um, is, is tough to answer. You know, I, I have to be honest, we, one of the questions that, that I get at the Conservation Foundation, people ask me for, for recommendations on trees. I just have a really hard time ever recommending many evergreens here in the Chicago suburbs because they just, they're just not happy. This, this seems to be a little far south for them to really thrive and be happy. And I say this as someone who, when I bought my house, the original landscapers threw in a dozen evergreens and called it a day. So I'm now dealing with 20 foot tall evergreens that are half dead and costing a lot of money to slowly remove one at a time. Absolutely. And, and most people want the evergreens for that, you know, six, eight, 10 foot and lower screening. And then those bottom needles die out because they're wet and cool. So it promotes the fungus. Mm -hmm. And so then to, to help the tree prune out those infected branches. So now you've got that telephone pole with a spire on top. Yep. And you're like, well, great. I really wanted the lower screening. Right. Okay, well, I, boy, I've got this great program where we can prune out the dead branches and we can treat the, the alive ones and, you know, we can keep your tree growing better. We're like, well, that's not the look I want. Exactly. Well, yeah. That's a cost effectiveness. Uh, and you're right. I mean, I feel like an old guy all of a sudden. I've been doing this for 30 years. It's a no-brainer. You plant the spruce tree, you walk away. I mean, trees grow. Right. What's yep. the big deal? Well, I, I, you know, guess what? Over the last six, eight years, spruce trees, the Colorado blue spruce trees specifically, just do not do well. And it's very frustrating. Uh, a lot of associations, homeowners, like, I want an evergreen. I want some coverage. Yeah. I want screening. I don't blame you. Um, the palette for that selection is very, very small and narrow, and there's not a lot of options out there. So what, this is another question that I've seen kind of pop up in here. Do you have recommendations for trees that are good for screening then, or shrubs or things along those lines? I know what I usually recommend, but yeah. get your take. Okay, you don't want to go first? You go first. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm a big fan. Um, I like con color fur. Um, it looks like a blue spruce. It's not a blue spruce. It's twice as expensive as a blue spruce. It's soft. It's friendly. Um, con color fur would be, be one. We have a gorgeous one in our backyard. It's huge. Um, it, it's over 21 years now. Wow. Um, and it's, it's, I mean, people walk in the yard, you're like, what is that? That looks awesome. So con color fur. We have a Serving, couple of those in yeah. the children's garden at the Conservation Foundation. 
Yeah. And something I learned that I had absolutely no idea, if you take those needles and kind of crush them up a little bit and smell them, they smell like oranges. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so weird because you wouldn't expect it at all, but it totally smells like this really bright citrusy scent. Awesome. And, and, and how many people call them blue spruce? And they're not. Uh, they're kind color fur. Um, green giant arborvitae, arborvitae. And, you know, there's so many different varieties of arborvitae, so you really got to get narrow and specific. Um, yews, upright yews. You know, people think of yews as these little tiny ball shrubs you put underneath the windows in your front yard. Yes, that's one variety. There's an upright variety, um, and I've seen them 12 foot around patios, and they are this incredible, hardy, thick wall of evergreen. You know, and they, they started them at four foot and they didn't prune them, let them go, don't shear them, don't round them, don't top them, let them go. Um, upright yews can become big evergreens and be a, a nice tall hedge for some screening. Um, Norway spruce would be a, a spruce variety. Um, Serbian spruce would be another variety. Um, Swiss stone pine, gotta have some really good soil and some aeration. Uh, would, would be another variety. Um, so so that, would, that would be a few ideas right off the top of my head. So for me, because I'm always looking at, at native options, I kind of stay away from any of the evergreen type stuff. And I look at more like, um, like dogwoods, pagoda dogwood, depending on how wet the soil is and what the, the sun and soil conditions are in that area. Um, Things like uh, elderberry, dogwoods, uh, cranberry bush, American plum. Um, those are all things that I, I tend to rec or recommend for screening um, in lieu of evergreens. Sure. Yep. Uh, cool. I love a good uh, red twig dogwood, especially in the winter. They're gorgeous. Excellent. Um, okay, so Thomas wants to know, how should an individual homeowner decide whether to treat or remove an ash tree? Oh, great question. Um, uh, and looking at the time, Jamie, we're going to do one more after this, yep. and we're going to roll it. So no pressure. You get to pick the last question. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay, treat or remove the ash tree. We get this all the time. And, and the quick answer is, if the tree is important to you, treat it. Uh, if, if, it's, if it's in a really terrible spot, uh, ter I shouldn't say terrible, if it's, if it's gonna be very expensive to remove um, back property, fence, pool, steps, I mean, it's just gonna be really expensive to remove, to dismantle the tree and get it to a point where the tree can be disposed of. Um, maybe you're better off just treating it, you know, keep the tree. Um, and, you know, I, I've seen some trees that are three to four thousand dollars to remove because of where the tree is located, and they're looking at um, hundred hundred to one hundred and fifty bucks a year to do a treatment. Boy, you know, they're they're saying, "Geez, we'd, we'd rather keep it and move and let somebody else, you know, love the tree and own the tree." Uh, if the tree has value to you, then it's an asset. Then treat it. Again, I get to be a little smart alecky and I apologize. It's amazing to me how many people have us treat their crab apple three times, four times a year to keep the leaves on to look nice at a hundred bucks an application. And then we say, boy, you've got an ash tree in the backyard. You're looking at maybe $150 every year to treat that tree. You're like, oh yeah, forget that. We're not gonna do that. Okay, you're looking at about a thousand dollars to remove the tree. Oh yeah, we'd rather get rid of that tree. Okay, it's your tree. You, you do with it what you want to do with it. Um, and we'll just keep treating your crab apple. Um, so if it has value, it's an asset, take care of the asset. So. Excellent, excellent advice. So Skeet, it, we weren't able to get to all of the questions, which is, is pretty typical, that happens. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for all of this great advice that you had for us today. Um, if people have other questions, can they contact you? They're, they're better off to contact the Bartlett website okay. through their local office. Perfect. Because that way, 
if they need an arborist or they're like, wow, yeah, it sounds like we really would like an arborist to come out, the office can make an appointment as opposed to me answering their question and then sending them to another office. They can do that in one step. Okay, so perfect. Just contact your local Bartlett Tree Experts office. Yeah. And then I'm also putting my contact information up here too, as I always do, if people have other questions, if they're interested in conservation at home, or if they want to share an idea for a new webinar topic with me, please go ahead and drop me an email. I'm not at my desk right now. Um, if you leave me a message on my phone, I will get it. Um, but email is always the better option to get a hold of me. So that is my email address right there. So um, once again, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. It's been great having Skeet here with us. And thanks, everybody. We hope to see you back again on Monday. So thanks, Skeet. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Loving the trees. <laughs> All right. We will see everybody again. Have a wonderful weekend.